this is Tom Wallace, and here we're here with another episode of Angel Investing, uh, Florida Funders podcast that we put out on a pretty frequent basis um, that helps us educate our angel investors and learn from some of the best people in the industry. So we're always, I think as angel investors, all of us are trying to learn more and more and get better and better at angel investing. And I'm delighted with our guest this morning because he's got tons of experience and a really interesting background in investing. I will introduce Paul here in a second. For those of you who aren't familiar with Florida Funders, we're a hybrid between, between a venture capital firm and an, an, angel, uh, an angel network. And we find, fund, and build, uh, or focus on finding, funding, and building the next generation of great technology companies. Um, primarily in Florida, but we also invest a little bit outside of Florida as well. So with that, uh, Paul, welcome. Uh, you have a really um, interesting and storied background. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners? Fantastic. Uh, thanks very much, Tom and, and uh, Florida Funders. Uh, really like what you guys are doing down there. I hope you're, hope you're going to continue to make big successes happen out of that region. Uh, so my name is Paul Holland. Uh, I've spent my opera. Well, I grew up in the Southeast. My family's actually been, my father's family has been in the South for 360 years, plus or minus, um, uh, across, uh, across a bunch of different places. But I grew up in Southern Virginia, moved out to California 36 years ago, kind of followed a girl out here, which is kind of how it works sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, I've spent my operating career helping to start two software companies. Uh, one is a company called Pure Software. Uh, I did that company with Reed Hastings and Neil Hunt and Patty McCord and others who got more famous later. Uh, that company, uh, we went public, uh, got acquired by Rational, got acquired by IBM, ended up being worth about two and a half billion dollars. And then I uh, went back to the partner, uh, the venture partner who'd funded it, Andy Ratcliffe. By then he'd started Benchmark Capital. Uh, he asked me to go to a new company, Kana Communications, with Mark Ganey and Michael Horvath. Those guys are better known today as Strava. Kana went from 13 million to 9 billion in 27 months because that's what you did when you had internet infrastructure software that worked in the late 90s. Wow. Uh, and then after Kana, I got recruited over to Foundation Capital where I spent 18 years as a general partner. Uh, at Foundation, we've taken 3.5 billion of investor capital, so far turned it into about 400 billion of returns. To be fair, a big chunk of that's Netflix, but we have 28 other IPOs and uh, companies like Lending Club and Mobile Iron and Chegg and Sunrun and, and many others. Uh, and then uh, about well, a few years ago, as I was transitioning from foundation, I started working with Mach 49, um, which is kind of like the Y Combinator for the Global 1000. And uh, now I do a lot of work with large companies and help teach people how to become venture capitalists. So, Really, really fascinating background. So I got to, I got to, I'll jump right to the Netflix. You know, we got to hear that story. Uh, apparently, you, you, you met Reed at, at Pure Software. Um, how did the investing in, in Netflix coming up, come about? How early did you invest? Tell us that story. Yeah, so, uh, so I met Reed. Um, I, in fact, I was just on with, a, with a, a bank in South Africa this morning, and I met Reed when he had just finished three years in the Peace Corps teaching math, math in Lesotho and Swaziland in the homelands in pre-apartheid uh, breaking up South Africa. So my best friend from my job at the time, the Stanford Research Institute, was a guy named Matt Grady. Uh, he was an engineer from Stanford. And then his best friend from the Peace Corps was Reed Hastings. And uh, back in the day, uh, my girlfriend, uh, now my wife of 31 years, Linda Yates, and CEO of Mach 49, uh, we used to throw these parties uh, in our 20s, and everybody came to our parties, not because we were like, you know, some stars or anything like that. It's just everybody else was living forward in an apartment in Mountain View, and, you know, we had, a, we, had, we had our parties at our parents' house, so there was a pool and a hot tub and a barbecue. <laughs> And um, I so thought you were going to say you had really good wine or something. Nothing like that. This is in our 20s. Um, actually, we ended up one of our parties ended up in Fortune Magazine because they were this is when the East Coast media was sort of waking up to the Silicon Valley and they just wanted to figure out kind of what was going on. But at any rate, I met Reed in a hot tub. Uh, that was 31 years ago. Um, and uh, he's he, he always describes it in a funny way. He says first time in a hot tub in California with his clothes on. And uh, I said, yeah, well. My wife's girlfriend's family was Catholic. Now wife's family's Catholic. They still wear clothes in the hot tub. So, um, 
So I met him and then uh, I was finishing up a graduate degree at night at Berkeley and my friend Matt had reconnected Reed and me and he said, look, Reed started this really cool thing. Uh, he's found a way to find errors in code a thousand times faster than existing technology and he needs a business partner. So uh, he asked me to get involved. Eventually I joined um, and then, you know, as I said, we took Pure Software Public. Then I went on to the next startup, Kana, and then Reed, you know, he sort of suffered in silence for a while at the company who'd acquired Pure Software. And then he and Mark Randolph, and this story is now very famous, but Mark Randolph was, our, was my VP of marketing at Pure Software. So Mark and I were good friends there, um, you know, with Reed and Neil and Patty and everybody else. And Mark and Reed both lived over in Santa Cruz. They lived over at the beach and they commuted over the hill into the Silicon Valley. And so, uh, and they were both pretty frustrated with their kind of their golden handcuff situations at the company that acquired us. So they started brainstorming ideas. They had a bunch of ideas that weren't very good. Uh, somewhere in there, the mythical, not mythical, um, kind of late fee at Netflix, at uh, Blockbuster thing happened. Um, and, uh, and Reed's a, you know, very, very analytical guy. So I could totally believe that he would then look at that and say, well, why, you know, why do they, why, why do they, these late fees are so annoying? Why would they do it? And then to figure out that's 90% of the margin for a blockbuster. So, uh -huh. um, while I was at pure software, uh, there was a consultant who was brought in. His name was Mike Shu. Uh, we were all very young. So Mike was brought in to help us kind of learn how to run sales. Eventually I ended up running a big chunk of sales there. Um, so Mike, uh, joined, uh, foundation capital before I did. So he joined back in 97 and then I joined in 2001 and, um, how big Reed, of a fund was foundation capital at that time? Yeah. Great question. So, so foundation's first fund was a $75 million fund. So the foundation and, uh, so there was a predecessor firm to foundation called, uh, Merrill Pickard, Anderson and Iyer. And, and it was really one of the top, say, four or five firms in the Valley, um, you know, back in the day. Mm -hmm. And so Merrill Pickard uh, broke up into, into three pieces. Um, Merrill and Pickard retired. Um, and then uh, uh, one set of the people uh, started Foundation Capital and the other set of the people started Benchmark Capital. So that was kind of the origins of those two, the two, those two firms. So, uh, um, so my, my founding partners raised uh, $75 million. Back in 95, that turned into, well, it turned into over a billion because uh, it was a great time to be a venture capitalist in 1995. Mm -hmm. And then in 98, they raised a $98 million fund. And that fund, for a period of time, enjoyed the highest IRR in the history of venture capital. It had a 535% IRR. Um, so the first That's pretty handful, impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The first handful of investments there were Cordiant, um, Interwoven, Netflix, Net Zero, Ebates. Um, you know, I think out of 14 or 15 investments, six or seven went public uh, in that fund. Um, and it was just one of those things where the timing was so important because it was actually early 1998. So they deployed the capital. The dot com bust. Exactly, the right. So they deployed the capital very quickly and then they just had these spectacular returns. I mean, they put six million in Interwoven, they got like 240 million back. Uh, in about in about maybe I don't know twenty seven or twenty eight months. Um, so that was just it's just hard to describe how crazy it was in the nineties. But the Netflix story is different. So my partner Mike Shu uh, led the investment, went on the board. So his friend what year was, and, and what actually, year was that? What, what year was this? This was nineteen ninety eight. Um, so uh, so the the Series A was done by uh, Tim Haley. Uh, Tim was the recruiter at Pure Software, um, so he was our he was our management recruiter, uh -huh. and uh, and so he was the first guy to bite on Reed's message. You got to understand, you know, when when I helped Reed try to raise raise money for Pure Software, we were, we were really unsuccessful. Later, of course, you know, people wanted to put money in when it, when we realized we had a hit product, but he had to raise two hundred thousand dollars from friends and family. It took him a year to do it. Um, but you want know, to talk about seed investing that. That two hundred thousand ended up buying ten percent of the company. The company ended up being worth two and a half billion. So it worked out really well for aunts yeah. and uncles and cousins and yeah. classmates and all that stuff. So that was a really good seed investment. And then, um, so my partner Mike uh, led the B. Uh, so another pure software alum basically uh, led the B in, in Netflix. And then, um, you know, of course, Netflix wasn't able to make it out uh, before the dot com bust. Uh, and in fact, Netflix, you know, had had some pretty significant challenges that are pretty well documented along the way. 
um, you know, they kept running out of cash. And so uh, at one point, uh, well, the guys, Jay Hogue from TCB came in and did a spectacular round there, ended up owning a ton of the company and really, really helped make the company. Everybody around uh, uh, him was very grateful for that. Uh, but I think they owned a, a nearly 40% of the company at one point in time, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then there was one episode that's not terribly well understood, but Bernard Arnault, uh, LVMH, Hennessy, Moe, uh, very, you know, kind of iconoclastic leader, you know, Richard Branson type guy, Reed fl- got on a plane, flew to Paris, collected a $25 million check, came back, put it in the bank account for Netflix, and that, that kept them moving forward. So lots of challenges, and especially lots of challenges as the dot-com bust, because, you know, there were portfolios, and, and we were one of these. I mean, we had... We had probably 15 companies that we had absolutely no business being in uh, that made no sense at all after the dot-com bust. Uh-huh. But it was really easy for people to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And, and, we, and we at times were tempted to do that, tempted to kind of de-support Netflix during that time period. But they kept going, they kept growing. Um, and, and many of your listeners will remember this, but Netflix went public. I always ask people this question now. I said, I said, does anybody remember the value of Netflix? And I'll, I'll ask you. So what, what was the, what was the, what was the IPO uh, value for Netflix when they went public? I, I have, I have no idea, but I'm guessing it was pretty low and I'm going <laughs> to kick myself for not buying the stock. <laughs> so it was, uh, when they went public, it was $350 million was the market cap. And then uh, four months later, it was $180 million. So you could have bought 10% of Netflix for, 18 million now worth, oh you know, whatever Netflix, 200, 230 billion. Well, that was really um, before streaming, right? When they were just competing with Blockbuster, right? Well, what happened was they, so Barry McCarthy, who was a brilliant CFO there and now the COO of Spotify, um, Barry uh, will, will tell anybody who will listen that the IPO saved Netflix because we raised $75 million mm-hmm. uh, approximately. And the minute, the minute Netflix went public, it was an all out war. Amazon, Walmart, Blockbuster, even, I mean, who knows, people I don't even remember at this point were, were and the studios were all coming after them uh, because they finally woke up to the fact they were an existential threat to the media industry as it was known. Um, so, so that's what, and then the shorts took over. And, and so Reed was getting a lot of p- hassle from the market analyst uh, saying, hey, you know, you're spending too much on marketing. You you need to you need to generate a profit. And and so over and over again, he'd have this conversation. He says, "You don't understand the size of the market that I'm going after. Yeah. Like I, I need to. Yeah, you know, I think Netflix was the number one advertiser on the internet two years in a row back then. Really? Um, no idea. And that's what they were doing. They were building an audience. Uh, and you know, the company, as my partner Steve Asala said, the company was not named DVD by mail. It was named Netflix. And this is a, a funny story, but back in, I think, 2001, uh, Reed came over to the house and we lived in Palo Alto and he brought like a little dongle and we tried to attach it to the back of the AMX system that I had at the time, which is a precursor to Control 4, which uh-huh. is the system we use now. And we tried for like a couple hours because he was trying to send, he was trying to send something over the, over the internet, basically, um, which was essentially would have been, the, you know, at least my first experience with streaming. We couldn't get it to work. Um, and it took them a long time to really get it right. But when they did, you know, Reed's just one of these guys that like, like once he, once the bit flips, you know, he's just all in. Um, and he's so he had the vision so, for Netflix being a streaming company, even though it started out as we know is, is really getting your movies up through the mail. Yeah. Yeah. It was all along. The notion was that there would be enough bandwidth. So Reed's a, a guy, he gives talks around the world on education because that's really kind of where uh, his, his, his major outside passion is. He was actually the president of the State Board of Education in California for a while. So it's a, uh-huh. uh, not, not, not and a former understood. teacher, I, I heard you say. Former teacher, yeah, taught math in Lesotho. And then, uh, um, and then you know, was one of the top funders of, of innovative charter schools around the country, along with John Doerr and others. But he gives these talks, and, he, and I always love this, this, this talk that he did, he, he, he says, well, let's, let's consider there are two countries out there. One country um, decides to invest in broadband and, and, and really start to like, open up the pipes for its people. And then the other country doesn't. He says, well, the country that invests in broadband is going to take over the other country in 20 years <laughs> because they're going to be so much wealthier and so much wiser um, from that perspective. And yeah, so those are the things. And I, you know, full disclosure, I wasn't 
I was very hard at work running the go-to-market at Kana uh, when my partner Mike was smart enough to make the investment. Um, and then we made we actually reinvested in in a fund we had called the Leadership Fund in the public markets. Uh, but you know the the tough thing about it is when you have a high flyer, um, and and by then it wasn't nearly anywhere near the high flyer that it was. I mean, if you look at Netflix stock price, it kind of did this and this and this and this and this, and then it did that, right? And it, wow. then it did that after like five years. Um, and so eventually we had to distribute our stock because our sure our LPs, you know, they're like, hey, send us the stock. So we did we did quite well on the investment, but when you Think about it today. We owned eleven point one percent, so we didn't do that well. <laughs> well, uh, when did you realize that Netflix? You said they went through a lot of cash and some very difficult times, which is very common, as we all know. At, at yep. Any company, I mean, there's always ups and downs. Never, never a linear rise to the to, to the top. When did you, as an investor, realize, hey, they're going to make it? This is really something special. Was it not till after they went public? <sighs> Well, I mean, I, it, probably my partner, Mike, would be the better one to answer that question in that sense. I mean, you know, there was always a very strong belief around the board and around the company and a, and a belief in Reed and his team. I mean, he had a, he had a dream team of people uh, that, you know, that really helped take that company public and, and, and stayed on for quite some time afterwards in that perspective. But, you know, I, I think it was one of these companies that because of the red envelopes and because of the prevalence and the penetration in the, in the tech community, um, you know, well, well before my brother and sister-in-law down in Orlando were hearing about Netflix, everybody here knew about Netflix because they saw the red envelopes everywhere, right? They got them, they, you know, they saw their neighbors, then their neighbors would tell them about it, then they'd sign up. I mean, Portola Valley, which is where I live, was a little bit of a proxy for as a cohort. <clears throat> San Jose was the was the biggest city that they tracked initially um, because it was it was just done by mail, right? So it was physical. But yeah. Portola Valley is a is a lot of Stanford people here, a lot of tech people here, and so they'd look and say, okay, now we're at one percent of Portola Valley, right? And by then they were probably at two tenths of a percent of San Jose, and then by the time they got to one percent of San Jose, they were probably, you know one fiftieth of a percent of Tampa, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's how they measured their cohort. And then, you know, the, the, the big thing that was the big mover in the early days of the company was when they brought Tom Dillon in to run distribution. And it was, and it was this, this, this very mundane thing that they figured out, which was next day mail. So next day mail provided the effect, effectively like the, like the liquidity for the company, not financial liquidity, but the use liquidity, usage liquidity. So once they figured out next day mail, then people, then, then the, then really the velocity started to kick in, right? Because then people didn't have to wait a week and, and lose it and all that kind of stuff. So, and then eventually, yeah, lots of fits and starts on, on the streaming side, but, um, you know, super committed to it. And then I, another anecdote, and I'll, I'll go back to you on this, but the, uh, I have friends in, in, in media and they, and their, their point of view was like, Hey, you know, we, we got to take advantage of these Netflix guys. They're, they're overpaying for everything. They're overpaying for our, our content libraries. They're overpaying for our future distribution. They're all this stuff. And I was like, you know, reads, read doesn't overpay. <laughs> it's not, it's not there. There's a plan behind that somewhere. And then of course, You're underestimating this guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For three years later, all those guys got completely sidestepped. Um, and now, what a great yeah, story. So we'll move off of Netflix. But one last question from the original, original investment that foundation made yep. when they exited, how many times what was it? 20 X or 50 X hundred X. What, how, what did you guys do on that? Well, if you go back to the first investment, if you just hold steady, the first investment, it was probably in the hundred X range as a guess. Yeah. Um, but, awesome. but, uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's scary to think, I mean, it's, I actually don't know what the to today, it's probably, probably, a probably today it's more like 10,000 X, <laughs> 10, but yeah. X. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, we, we, again, we certainly did well, but you know, it's one of the top five returners in the history of venture capital. And right. And so it's, it's really hard to, it's hard to know, you know, that that's going to happen. Uh, sure. especially it's not like snowflake. It's not like it goes public and then it's worth 80 billion, you know, like that day. Right. That's, that's, that's a little easier to decide to hold, <laughs> Um, from that perspective, yeah, but anyway. Right. 
Well, uh, congratulations. That's, that's, a, that's a great story. Um, it segues into the question I like to ask, in, one of the questions I like to ask investors. Obviously, you guys saw something in Reed. He sounds like a very, well, he obviously is a very special human being, very talented, very smart. What do you look for in founders at Foundation Capital? You did a lot of investments over the years. Uh, and how important is, is the founder vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the product, the, the problem they're solving? How do you look at that? Yeah, so actually Reed's got a point of view that I completely agree with, which is that the number one trait we're looking for is persistence. Um, when I think of the number of times that, you know, I mean, it took him two years to write the code for pure software and he did it in an unheated house up in La Honda, up in the hills. I'm looking up in the hills here, which are kind of cold up there, you know, um, and his wife was working as like a dozen. He did it while he was freezing his ass off. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's freezing his ass off and not making any money. And, um, and so, you know, there's so many different ways that he could have stopped. I started to work with him really early and then I had to peel off and go work on something else for a while because we, you know, we weren't getting any traction, getting raising money. Uh -huh. And then fortunately, you know, I came back and, and he was kind enough to let me join. But, um, uh, so persistence is a huge part of it. Um, and, and so that's, you know, as we're looking at founders, you know, we're just like, there's just over and over and over again at pure software. He used to, this is, you know, dates us all, but you know, we had a view graph, right. With a grease pencil. And so he would, he'd give talks to the company and he would put how many times that we bet the company, you know, when he sent me to Europe to go, you know, as a total rookie on that dimension to go start and build the European practice you know, that was a bet the company move. Right. And so, so that's a, you know, it's, it's this kind of persistence and belief that, that we look for, you know, the founder is super important. Um, you know, Don Valentine, you know, founder of, of uh, Sequoia, you know, kind of legendary venture capitalist featured in, in the, in the documentary film, I made something venture that you know about. Um, he is, is rumored to have been at a conference and, uh, down in Monterey and he was listening to his colleagues, uh, at other venture firms get up and talk and they're like, it's the team, it's the team. It's this mystical, you know, thing. And they're all repeating it over and over again. And he gets up and he says, because Don's a, he was a spicy dude. Um, he gets up and says, we've hidden some of the worst teams in management history behind some great products. And he was talking about Cisco at that time. Right. Okay. So, um, and, and it was more the founding team, which is that's, that's documented in, uh, in, the, in the film. But, um, but yes, I mean, you know, I, I, for, so for me, you know, I funded Chegg, which is, you know, which is my, my first and will likely be my only Decacorn, I guess. Um, and when I met the founders, uh, the way I describe it is I said, you know, I, 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 I met these two very earnest founders from the Midwest, uh, Ayush Pumba and, uh, and um, um, oh gosh, how am, I, how am I blanking on him? Just uh, Oshman Rashid, right? So these are two kids that were foreign students at the University of Minnesota. University of Minnesota apparently has the highest percentage of foreign students. Um, so they, you know, formed a friendship there uh -huh. and they were looking for ideas. They'd come from entrepreneurial families in, in India and Pakistan and they, we're looking for uh, ideas. So they came up with this concept, let's do a Craigslist for colleges. And then they started to do the thing. And then the only thing that people really wanted is they wanted cheaper textbooks um, because it was, you know, for people in state schools and community college, textbooks were a really big part of their bill and, and often yeah. caused people to have to, you know, take out loans or, or get other jobs or whatever. So, and then it just took off like a rocket. People wanted these used textbooks. So we became known as kind of the Netflix of college textbooks with, with Chegg. Um, ultimately, over time, it was determined by the board, you know, Ted Schlein from Kleiner and I were on the board at that time, that we needed to move on from the founding team, running the company and go out and get a new leadership. And ultimately, we brought in Dan Rosenzweig. And he really kind of took the company to the next level. So I would say that's an example of that the idea was so fundamentally strong <clears throat> uh -huh. and, and there was such uptake from the market that, that you would have to have been really bad as a manager <laughs> to, to screw it up. Um, and, and so, you know, but those are so what incredibly rare. What year was this, Paul, when you first invested in Chegg? 2010. Okay. Because I, I remember a company that, that I was around in, in the late 90s that was trying to do that. And so yep. maybe, yeah. maybe part of it's timing because they, they, they were not successful. It was called eSchool. Yeah. 
Book Renter was another one. They they had they had really kind of come and and were really more like a, a knockoff in that sense. And you know the the similarities with Netflix. In fact, we hired Tom Dillon uh, when he retired from Netflix. We had Tom Dillon, the logistics head at Netflix, to come to Chegg because the similarities were we generated massive demand, um, but it was very episodic. And so at one point we were shipping a million books an hour. <laughs> so we had, to, we had to build this giant facility in Louisville, Kentucky next to UPS to be able to do it. Um, so so I, it's, it's a mixed bag. You know, I just had one of my companies exited uh, Respond Software. Um, Mike Armistead, CEO, Mike, when I started at Netflix, <clears throat> I met Mike at a party. I introduced him to Reed. Reed hired him as our first product manager. So Mike and I have been together for 28 years. When I went to, Pierce, to Foundation, he was the first guy I called. He became my first entrepreneur in residence at Foundation. Later, founded a company, Fortify, that, that he did very well with. Um, but he w uh, had an idea. He was running, basically running software at HP. He wanted to spin out and do another security company. So that's an example where the founder and the founding team were, were absolutely crucial because the idea, the premise was a very exciting premise, applying artificial intelligence to security is what we tried to do at Respond. But we had to iterate many, many times on it. So that was not one where the idea or the product was going to carry the day. It was the team that carried the day. Yeah. And we just sold the company for north of $200 million to, uh, to um, FireEye uh, last month. Um, and the reason all that happened was because of Mike and the team. So it's, 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 it's just, the answer is it depends. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. Um, you work for your wife now. Yes, I do. <laughs> and uh, which is, you know, talk about a power couple. Yeah. Um, and, and you guys, as I understand it, with, um, with Mach, was it 49? Mm -hmm. 49. You go yeah. into uh, large companies or companies and you set up for them incubators, accelerators. Yep. Um, many of the companies we invest in come out of incubators and accelerators. And, you know, I'd like to get your perspective on, um, A, working, working for your wife and that whole thing. And just from a personal standpoint, I kind of find it curious and, uh, and cool, by the way, very cool. And then secondly, you know, these incubators and accelerators, what are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? Because we see, as we invest in companies, come out of these, sometimes we get these companies and they're, you know, we start working with them. We're like, did they teach you anything in that place? Like, how do you not know, you know, to have good financial reporting or how do you know not to have a product roadmap or what the hell was, you know, anyway, so you get the idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so what, what Linda's come up with. So, so Linda's background was really well suited for, for starting Mach 49. So by the way, Mach 49, uh, she originally wanted to name the company Mach 37, which is to speed the exit the Earth's atmosphere, because the language they use is exiting the mothership, right? Like, how do you get get away from the gravitational field of the mothership? There's a lot of space references. Um, uh -huh. But Mach 37 was taken, so she chose 49. One, it's actually the, to exit the sun's gravitational pull. It's interesting, Mach 49, uh, the speed that's required, but also because it was a, it was a bigger number. And she wanted it to evoke memories of the, uh, the 49ers, the 1849 49ers. Um, she's a fifth generation California entrepreneur. Um, so it's, uh, so that was kind of important for her, but she grew up in strategy consulting. She started a company when she was 32 called Stratagos with Gary Hamill and CK Perhalad. So really the first kind of corporate innovation, pure play company, uh, later sold that went on the board at Sybase, went from three bucks, to 65 bucks. And then she started Mach 49 um, really to try to help large companies compete against the startups that were really starting to eat them alive. Um, when I did the film Something Ventured, uh, I did kind of a follow on piece with Huffington Post called Dreamers and Disruptors. And that was really articulating um, how the venture industry for 50 years had funded the dreamers. You know, Reed Hastings wanted to fix software development, right? That was his passion. Uh, and then later, we wanted to fund Reed to blow up the media industry. We funded Brian for hospitality. We funded Travis for transportation. We funded Elon for whatever the hell he wanted to do kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So the, the industry had moved from that perspective. And as a consequence, the, all the large industries and large companies were in the crosshairs of the Silicon Valley and these, and these very um, aggressive startups. So uh, she started with the notion of two things, disrupting inside out. And that's helping companies launch new ventures or build incubators. 
and then disrupting outside in. And that's the part that I run for her, which is really to bring the principles and the practices of top tier venture capital to corporations and to help them kind of do a better job there. Mm -hmm. On the incubator side and the accelerator side, she's built, you know, just full stop objectively the most, uh, uh, um, you know, the most robust methodology in the world uh, around this. Um, so robust that Harvard has decided that their big strategy book next year is disrupting inside out by Linda Yates. So, uh, and it just blows away the other kind of modalities that are out there. Um, she has a 90% success rate uh, when incubating these companies. Um, and part of it is that she has five preconditions for success, right? You have to have a full-time team. You've got to have a new venture board that's engaged around it. You've got to have seed funding awaiting the company coming out of the other side. You've got to have a leader uh, associated with it. And then you've got to be able to work with, with some other aspects of this. You've got to do what we call kind of bring the Silicon Valley inside. Uh -huh. And then she'll turn down clients that, that won't adhere to those conditions. Because if you don't adhere to those conditions, you're likely to fail. The, the you know, corporate incubators, the output of corporate incubators, eventually 92% of the things that come out of them fail. Um, and so she set out to fix that basically. And by the end of this year, uh, she'll have incubated nearly 40 new companies uh, for, you know, 15 or 20 of the Fortune 500. And, Including uh, Intel, right? Didn't, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. That? Right. Re rebuilt the incubator for Intel, Stanley Black & Decker, Price Waterhouse, Schneider Electric, and others with this new methodology and this new approach. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's exciting. And then for me, in terms of working for her, I had been planning my wind down at, at foundation because winding down as a GP is kind of complicated uh, in, in, a, in a big fund. And so I'd been planning my wind down and I thought I'd be working on more creative projects and other stuff. But uh, I started just helping advise some of their clients. And then it turned out that there was this really strong need uh, for bringing in the principles and practices of top tier venture to these companies. So now I've got a our concept we call GP in residence. So I've got kind of a squad of, you know, guys of our vintage basically, cause it's guys, cause that's the vintage. Um, and, uh, and they're on average, we have 20 years of experience as general partners in top tier funds. And we go parachute in to uh, these companies like TDK, where we co-founded their corporate venture group, JetBlue, Goodyear, uh, Prino Ricard, so Absolute Vodka, Jameson Whiskey, all that stuff. So it's a new model um, and it's gone really well and her stuff's gone really well. And as I think, you know, about four months ago, uh, she was acquired by a public company. So it's yeah. a, it's a fun, I mean, this is where the kind of like, you know, my, my life partner and my wife and love of my life kind of, you know, I'm proud of her when she was acquired, when Mach 49 was acquired, it's the first time that I know of, I ran this by some friends at NASDAQ yesterday because I'm testing this to see if anybody can, can, can dispute it. It's the first hot Silicon Valley startup acquired by a public company where the startup was majority owned by women um, because Mach 49 is not taking any outside investment. And, and she has a phenomenal team, incredibly diverse team, uh, and, and it's majority owned by women. That's great. So, That's awesome. Love to hear that. Love that. Love stories like that. We are. We always look for. We 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 at Florida funders are are very. We would like to fund more women and minority uh, founders. We like yeah. we like backing women founders and and for yep. a multitude of reasons. And uh, so love to hear stories like that. And uh, that and and you and I have talked about this. We are still hopeful here at Florida funders that. We're going to do something together with Mach 49 and you bet. talk yeah. to some of the big companies in Florida that, that yeah. might be a good fit. You're right in the sweet spot of, you know, the company, the large companies in places like central Florida, eastern, uh, western Florida. Um, that's the sweet spot of where Mach 49 works. I and mean, we work with a lot of really traditional companies and we're trying to help them make the transition to the world of digital and virtual before it's too late. Yeah, that's super cool. Uh, we're getting a little short on time, and I definitely wanted to ask you being, um, you know, pretty much lifelong or 30 year, three decade, whatever, Californian, and in terms of, you know, from your career, you know, we're, we're seeing more and more an exit from California. Some of this may be because of COVID, and people realize now you can work from anywhere, and Zoom's taking over everything, and then you know, some of it, some of the, the big time names that Tim Ferriss is and uh, 
uh, Peter Thiel's and now Elon Musk just two weeks ago announcing he's leaving California for Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wanted to get your perspective on that. I mean, we're here in Florida and we see that as very positive for us. Um, do you think that's, that trend is going to continue? And, you know, which, what, what do you, how do you look at that being on the other side of it? Yeah, I mean, I try to be objective about this. I'm, I mean, my first comment will be a little bit tongue in cheek, but the but the people that are telling that story over and over again are the Florida and the Texas people, <laughs> so because um, yeah, it serves their interests and their sure. their desires. Um, uh, but but you know, there's also an element of truth to it. I mean, California is a you know it's a very high tax state, um, and uh, and for people that are you know, I mean, Elon Musk went from being a reasonably wealthy guy to being whatever the top five wealthiest guys in the world. And so, you know, for him to move his operations out is going to save him billions of dollars because, um, you know, we do have a state tax here and so forth. Um, you know, I, I, I always, you know, have to just kind of remind people, we've also created the sixth big, biggest economy in the world over the last 50 years with that tax rate. Um, so it's not all about taxes. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a, there's a certain critical mass of, knowledge and experience and insight, especially around technology, and you're, and you're dealing with this, like you're trying to create that critical mass down there. I know how dedicated you guys are to that. Um, and then this is the part that's going to be the edgiest, but you know, some of the states that are crowing the most about if they are able to get one of these companies are some of the states that frankly aren't very tolerant. Um, and, and intolerance is, is the anathema of, of making money as an entrepreneur in technology. Um, and so, you know, I, I had these discussions kind of even pre-Trump where, you know, my kid's soccer team, holy cow, I had five religions on my kid's soccer team. I had three Muslims, so I had a couple of Jewish kids, I had a couple of Hindu kids, I think I had a Shinto kid, right? <laughs> um, California is incredibly uh, inviting and tolerant and open, and that is the secret of the success of the Silicon Valley. <clears throat> you know, we've attracted entrepreneurs from all over the world, but we can screw it up. You can kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. And, and I, I'm, I'm actually grateful that these guys are making such a fuss because um, maybe it'll begin to start to have an impact from that perspective here. But, um, you know, we, we, we have kind of a different approach here. It's a little bit more like Europe here than it is in, say, Texas. So. Yeah, that's, you know, that, that being the melting pot, you know, the world's best and brightest trying to get to California and you guys being very um, inclusive and accepting. Richard Florida, the author, I don't know if you know his book. I yeah, guess. yeah, I know him, yeah. He's well documented that how much that tolerance is a big part of creating yeah. a great city and um, in, in San Francisco and folks, yeah. places like that. I like to think here in Florida, we're getting a lot better at that. You know, Miami. Well, I think, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's getting better everywhere. I mean, I think it, I mean, look, I mean, let's face it. You and I grew up in public schools in the South and you could say things to people in, in, you know, 30 years ago that would be unimaginable to talk about now. And I'm not even talking about race. I'm talking about like, you know, LGBT, you know, kind of stuff and things like that. Right. And so, you know, the crudity has, has passed, I think in many cases, although I think we saw, uh, an unfortunate resurgence of this in the last four years, but, but hopefully that'll kind of, you know, sort itself out. Um, but, but I, but I, I just think, you know, um, I, I tell this story a lot and we can close on this just cause I think it's entertaining, but, um, I started my career at SRI and, uh, there was a group there called the center for economic progress. And what they did was basically they, they sort of packaged this, Hey, we'll make your, you, we'll help you do Silicon Alley and Silicon Glen and Silicon Swamp and all this stuff. We'll package all the juice, you know, that makes the yeah. Silicon Valley work. And it was a great sales pitch, right? I mean, it was, and they did really well. The guy who did it was, was he was actually very good. Um, but they had this, uh, they, they got this um, client, a uh, set of clients, and it was, uh, it was all these Ohio River, Ohio River Valley medium-sized cities and, and related. Like, so it was sort of like Cincinnati and, and Dayton and Louisville and all the way down into like, um, you know, even like places like Knoxville and Memphis and things like that. So it was like a collection of these, of these cities. And they said, Hey, you know, we want a Silicon Valley, help us get a Silicon Valley started. And yeah. so they said, okay, great. Here's the study. And, and they said, what, you know, what do we have to do? And they said, okay, first you got to have a gay community. And they're like, <laughs> what? Yeah. You know, like, you know, they're all this, 
this is, you know, this yeah. is not the bastion of, of, of like, you know, gay rights, right? Mm -hmm. You gotta have a gay community. And like, what do you mean? He said, well, you need an artistic community. And, and because that artistic community are gonna create the galleries and the music venues and the things like that. And then the, the software developers, that's where they wanna live. That's where they wanna hang out. That's south of market in San Francisco, right? You wanna create this sort of fertile environment for creativity. And, and, and for openness, you know, from that perspective. And, and I, I run into these debates with people all the time because like, oh, no, no, we can do it this way. We can do it that way. And I'm like, you can't. You, 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 you're going to get stronger in Tampa. You're going to get stronger with Florida founders because you're more tolerant. Yep. It's just I simply put. I remember the name of Redford Florida's book, but he documents his, it's really. Yeah, it was, um, it was a, the. Something principle. I, 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 that was, it was incredibly well done. Like, like he did that book and it was like, he's saying exactly what I'm thinking, you yeah, know, in exactly. that sense. He came to Tampa and Florida and, and spent a bunch of time here and yeah. some of our tech comments. But you know, I mean, there's, there's, you know, we can, <laughs> you can have a very tolerant culture without having the tax rates we have to be blunt. Right. Sure. And you can have, uh, you know, you can have much lower tax rates, which is what you guys have down there and you can have a more tolerant culture. Right. And, you know, so eventually these things will kind of like blend, but, you know, the stats are still there. It's the Silicon Valley is still the king of the universe for the moment in this world. And, uh, but we're, you know, we're, we're conscious of the fact that we could lose that title. Yeah. Um, in Florida, we, we've come a long way. We still have a long way to go. We had two unicorns in the last two weeks. Um, oh. Lu Luminar out of Orlando, which is yeah. LIDAR technology for autonomous vehicles. The founder dropped out of Stanford at 17 years old. He's only 25. He's now a billionaire. And Gotta then uh, Ship Monk out of Fort Lauderdale, which uh, is, um, I don't know that story as well. I just read about yeah. it, but they, they, they're now unicorn. And they're, awesome. a couple, I mean, they're a couple, uh, I, they're, they're young immigrants from, I want to say, you know, Eastern Europe somewhere. Sure. So, yeah. I mean, I, I'm thrilled to see that. I, I want America to succeed, you know, and so I, you know, it doesn't all have to be happening out of here. So, hey, listen, I've, I've really enjoyed it, Tom. I got a, I got a client, so I got to, got to, got to jump. So. Paul, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, great stories. Great having you on the show and I look forward to working again. Awesome questions. Really enjoyed it. All right. Talk to you soon. Take Thank it easy. You. All right. Good luck, everybody. Thanks. Thanks so much. To our listeners, if you want to learn more about Florida Funders, you can go out to floridafunders.com. We have podcasts out there. We have companies out there you can invest in. Um, we, for founders, if you want to apply for funding, it's a very easy process on our website to get, us, to get you into our process. Uh, if you're looking to raise money, we're all about finding funding and building the next generation of great, great technology companies. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Thanks so much.